department. Um, he um, is studying herpetology. He'll explain to everybody what that's all about. Um, as I indicated in my intro email a little while back, um, he did his undergrad at Grand Valley State in biology, uh, two years studying the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, uh, conservation and population estimation. Um, he's got a master's from Eastern Michigan University in ecology, evolution and organism biology. Is that correct, Jeff? Yep, that is correct. Um, thesis completed on population genetics um, structuring of common snakes in urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, presentation, we'll talk about general diversity in Michigan, how to get involved with herpetology, how to get involved in citizen science, and then a few uh, additional uh, topics that he'd like to share with us towards the end of the program. So I'm really excited about this, and um, I'm going to step to the side and let Jeff take it from here. Thanks, uh, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully, is that coming through? Does everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. 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 Awesome. OK. So yes, this is a presentation uh, that I'm calling Introduction to Michigan Herpetology. I figured I could focus this uh, talk on trying to introduce people to what is herpetology, uh, what uh, sort of diversity we have in Michigan and kind of how to get you, like how to go about doing herpetology um, just like you would do birding or any sort of other wildlife activity. All right, so uh, this is just a little outline, kind of already went through this. We're gonna talk about what herpetology is, uh, what are some ways to identify common species here in Michigan, uh, and then ways to get involved and go about it. And then I wanted to talk about three interesting topics I thought uh, that relate to Michigan herpetology, which are overwintering behaviors in some species, uh, social behaviors in some species, and then a really, really unique uh, sexual strategy amongst one, some of our uh, salamanders here in Michigan. So as you can see from this picture on the right that I think herpetology is really fun uh, and that uh, you can see, it, one of the cool things about it is that you get really up close with the animals um, which is if you've only done like birding, for instance, in the past, that's not something you often get to do. You don't get to see uh, the animals really up close. So that's one of the cool things that I think uh, goes along with herpetology. Um, so what is herpetology? Uh, Carl Linnaeus came up with the name herpetology and it uh, comes from the Greek word for creeping animal. So he did not like herpetology very much. He thought uh, this group was kind of gross and he didn't really want to study it, so he just kind of threw it away off to the side. Um, and that's how we end up with the word herpetology. What it means in reality is, if you can see this red square on my screen here, that all the groups in this uh, red square are what we mean when we talk about herpetology. So that's reptiles and amphibians. So it is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Um, and so if you know anything about phylogenetics, or maybe you ever looked at a phylogenetic tree, uh, you might notice that uh, amphibians and reptiles are not really related very much at all. Uh, amphibians are as closely related to humans as they are as to reptiles. Um, and so evolutionarily, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But because they're ecological behavior and historically they have been studied together, um, we still kind of group them together. Uh, these are all ectothermic or what uh, you might call a cold-blooded animal. Um, and so because of that, they often have very similar ecological characteristics and life history characteristics. And so they are studied together because of that. And then one of the kind of key things that goes along with herpetology is this is one of the most um, endangered groups in uh, amongst vertebrate taxa. Um, they face a lot of habitat loss. Um, there are lots of new diseases that uh, are popping up with these animals. Um, and there's also like a lot of pet trade that goes on uh, because lots of people seek these exotic pets. And because of that, there are lots of species that have been nearly driven to extinction just from people poaching animals out of, the, uh, out of their habitats. Um, so for instance, 
61% of turtles in the world are considered endangered by the IUCN uh, red list. Um, and then also uh, uh, amphibians in general, 40% of them are considered endangered. And a lot of that does have to do largely with habitat loss. Okay. So when we move into talking about Michigan diversity, uh, this is kind of what the breakdown of uh, herpetology in Michigan looks like. We have 13 frogs and toads, 10 salamanders, two lizards, 18 snakes, one of which is venomous to humans, and then 10 different turtles. And I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I figured I would talk about some of them just to, if you're not super familiar with what these things look like, it's kind of self-defeating to talk about something that you don't know anything about. So, um, so a lot of people don't know we have lizards in Michigan. This is just one of the lizards here that we have. Um, and so if uh, I thought this was really cool when I learned about this back in the day, um, and just kind of goes to show that there's a lot of cool, interesting diversity here right in Michigan, um, which you wouldn't normally think of a place for like reptiles and amphibians maybe. Um, another note about doing herpetology in Michigan is like if you're a birder, for example, you know, there are hundreds of bird species that live in Michigan. If you were ever going to try to see all the birds that come to Michigan, it would be a life's project. Um, but in herpetology, you could, you know, over the course of like a couple years, maybe, uh, if you know where to look, you could probably try to, you could see every single uh, herp um, in Michigan, which would be kind of a cool thing to be able to say like, oh, I've seen all the, you know, diversity in the state. Um, so it's kind of a fun aspect, I think, that goes along with herpetology, specifically in Michigan. Okay. So moving into some of these species, I just kind of wanted to go over and how to identify some of these animals. To, so if you're ever out in the wild, you can you know how to identify the things you're seeing. Um, in the corner of some of these slides, you'll see these kind of silhouettes. Um, the red kind of like insert here is that corresponds to one inch um, in size. So you can kind of get an idea of how big each of these animals are by kind of using this uh, metric here, okay? So to start off, um, the Eastern American toad, that is this guy on the screen here that you can see, um, the, they are found throughout the entire state. You know, uh, they live in a lot of different habitats, um, fairly common to find. Um, and they are often confused with the next species I'm going to talk about, the Fowler's toad. Um, and the way that you go about identifying this species, if you notice, uh, toads have warts, right? And so if you look at this toad here, you'll see there are a lot of little warts on the back of it. And in these dark spots that you see, you really only see about one wart for each dark spot. And that is the case with the Eastern American toad, okay? Um, and then another uh, aspect of, especially looking at frogs and toads, is that you can listen for them. That's often the best way to find frogs and toads. It's just like listening to bird songs, you can listen to frog calls. And so I'm gonna play a, the frog, some, a few frog calls for us uh, in this presentation. Hopefully it comes through okay. But this is the sound of an Eastern American toad. It's probably something you've all heard before. Kind of this uh, long sort of trilly sort of call. Um, you often hear it in early spring. Uh, these guys, they for about two weeks out of the year, they really breed like crazy. And you'll usually hear that in like ponds around certain areas. Um, our next species, you see that this is the Fowler's toad here. Very similar looking animal. Um, but if you notice those warts, you can see that there are more warts, multiple warts in each of those dark spots um, along its back. You often find them in very similar sorts of areas. Um, and so it can be a little confusing to try to distinguish one from the other. And the call of this one, the Fowler's toad is kind of like the obnoxious cousin of the Eastern American toad. Um, it's Kind of similar, but it's a lot more obnoxious and abrupt sort of sound. So let's see if we can get that going here. Hear that a little bit more abrasive of a call. Just kind of give you an idea of what that sounds like. All right, moving in to our next species here, we have the green frog. This is something that maybe some of you have probably seen before. Um, very, once again, very common throughout the state. Um, we find them in a lot of different habitats, uh, you know, usually in wet areas with ponds, or you can find them in wetlands or even in lakes and stuff. Um, and even though this is called the green frog, they come in a lot of different color. They're very rarely actually just green. Um, and kind of a fun fact about them is that the way they get their green color is 
from producing a blue pigment and a yellow pigment. And if you have ever mixed some colors together, you know that that creates green. Mixing blue and uh, yellow together gives you a green color. Um, and sometimes these individuals will not be able to produce uh, the yellow pigment due to a uh, mutation. And so they're actually blue. They're like sky blue, which is really kind of cool whenever you find them out in the wild. Uh, but the way to identify this species is if you, I have say this dorsal lateral ridge. So that refers to this here, this kind of like thick ridge going along the back. Um, and no other species in Michigan has this kind of line that goes down the back um, past what is the eardrum here down the body. Um, and the call for this uh, species is probably something a lot of you have heard. Um, if you've ever been in like a wetland around a lake or something like that. Um, it's kind of like rubber bandy kind of sound. That is a green frog. All right. Um, so this species is often confused um, with our bullfrog. So they look very similar, but if you notice about the, that, that dorsal lateral ridge, it is lacking in the bullfrog. You see that it wraps around the eardrum here, um, kind of showing you, it's kind of, once you see that, it's very obvious that uh, the difference between the two. Um, and so uh, these guys are huge. You see the, the, I couldn't even fit the little silhouette here because they're so big. These guys will eat birds, they'll eat fish, they eat other frogs, they'll eat snakes. Pretty much anything they can fit in their mouth, they're gonna try and eat, um, which is kind of crazy. Think about a frog eating a bird, not something you normally we would think about. Um, and this is once again, this is probably a frog call. All of you have heard while you've been out like birding and doing that sort of activity. Um, it's usually referred to as like those like groaning or droning sort of sound um, that you hear kind of over and over and over. So, yeah. not the red winged blackbird, but we're here in just a second here. It's kind of droning, groaning. That sound, that is uh, a bullfrog call. So if you've ever heard that, now you know what that is. Um, next, we have our tree frogs. So we have actually two species of tree frogs here in Michigan. We have the eastern and the Cope's gray tree frog. Um, and they are, by sight, indistinguishable. You cannot tell them apart from looking at them. Um, they all kind of have this sort of modeled kind of pattern on them. And they're not always gray. They're kind of, they can be green, they can be kind of brown, um, but they kind of have this sort of stubbly sort of texture and this modeled pattern. And they really, they look like a lichen on the side of a tree, um, which is where you normally would find them on some sort of tree uh, near maybe like a little pond or something like that. Uh, but you can distinguish them uh, based on their call. And that's usually what herpetologists do is they listen for the different call between these two species. And so um, if you've ever walked around in like the woods at night, you probably heard uh, an Eastern gray tree frog. So let me play this one. It's kind of like a little chirpy sort of call here. I'm sure lots of you have probably heard that sort of call walking around at night. Um, that is the Eastern uh, gray tree frog. And then the Cope's gray tree frog is once again, kind of like the obnoxious cousin of the gray, of the gray tree frog. Um, it's a little bit more abrasive and uh, that kind of sound. So let me go ahead and that. It's not as chirpy or pleasant. It's kind of sounds like he's yelling at you. Um, that is the Cope's gray tree frog. All right, and then we go to our next species here, the spring peeper. Um, if you see this guy, uh, if you've ever walked around in the woods and see little things hopping around in the woods, it's very likely these guys. Um, they are pretty small and the thing to note about them is they have this X across their back, which is where they actually get their uh, species name, the crucifer, comes from this X pattern that they have on their back. And they're very common. You find them in lots of different uh, forests throughout the entire state. Um, and this Pretty much anywhere you go in the, the spring or summer, you hear these guys calling. They're called the Northern Spring Peeper because they have a little peepy sort of call. So let me, oh, it did not, but let me try this again. 
There we go. All those little kind of chirpy sort of sounds, those are all little spring peepers um, singing along. All right, and then last we have the wood frog, which is, this is once again, this is a very common species to find in the woods if you're walking around in the woods. Um, and the way kind of the distinguishing features of this is you have this sort of white lip on them. And then they also kind of have this little robber mask uh, on them as well. And so usually pretty, pretty easy to tell what you're looking at when you see that. Um, you often find them just on the forest floor. Um, and these kind of interesting about these guys is they, the second the snow starts melting, they are, they're also kind of melting um, and they're coming out and they're breeding immediately. And so you often will find them breeding in uh, when there's like still some ice on the ponds and stuff like that, which is pretty crazy. Um, and so they kind of have like a classic sort of frog call. It kind of sounds like a ribbit, ribbit sort of call. Um, so let's see here. Kind of like ribbit, ribbit, ribbit sort of call. And that's the sort of thing you'll hear very early on in the spring, usually. They breed for a really short amount of time. All right. Next, we're going to move into some salamanders here, just a few of them. Um, so probably the most common salamander you can find in Michigan is the Eastern Red-backed Salamander. And they're very cool for a couple reasons. Um, one is they have uh, two different color morphs. So these, this picture here, these are actually the same species. Um, and we have what is called the red back uh, phase, and we have what is called the lead back phase. So they've kind of got this sort of graphite sort of coloring. So that's kind of where they get that name for it. Um, second thing that's really cool about uh, these animals is that they um, are completely lungless. They do not have lungs. Um, so amphibians are very, they're well known for breathing through their skin. They do a lot of gas exchange across their skin because it's really thin. Um, and so in this group, this plethodon group, all of these salamanders have evolutionarily lost their lungs and they completely breathe through their skin, which I think is incredible. Um, and also because of that, they are completely terrestrial. So these salamanders don't have tadpoles. They're young hatch with legs um, and fully terrestrial terrestrial um, organisms, which is different from pretty much every other amphibian out there. Um, so these are, they're really cool and you can find them just about anywhere in the state. And next we have our blue spotted salamander. This is probably the second most common uh, salamander you can find in the state. Um, and so they are about the same size as the lead back or the red back salamander. Um, but you notice they have all these, they have this dark background with all these little blue fleck uh, spots kind of all over their body. Um, and uh, these animals, they belong to this ambistoma group here. <coughs> um, and that, that means that they are a mole salamander is what that group is kind of called in uh, English. Um, and so they have like these kind of chunky fat folds on their body, uh, which is kind of another distinguishing characteristic of these guys, which you'll see on in the next species. Um, these guys are of special concern here in the state, and that is mostly because of this sort of hybrid complex that they belong to that I plan to talk about uh, later in the talk. Um, all right, so now we have our spotted salamanders, so you can really see those kind of like fat folds on them. These guys are like really chunky salamanders. Um, uh, this, you, these guys are pretty common in the state, uh, but not as common as the other two. Um, and they're kind of, you can tell you got one of these because they have these really regular rows of spots kind of going down um, their bodies. And once again, they are also species of special concern. Uh, last salamander I wanted to mention to you guys is the tiger salamander. These guys are super cool. Uh, they're pretty big salamanders. Um, they can sometimes maybe be confused with the spotted salamander because they're both yellow and black. But if you kind of know that this pattern, uh, this pattern here on the tiger salamander, it's really kind of random and irregular. And so it's kind of a, they're pretty distinguishable from each other once you kind of know what you're looking for. Um, they are often found in woodland areas, but these guys will actually go on really long migrations, especially for salamanders of like miles going through like prairies and wetlands and all sorts of areas 
uh, trying to find different breeding ponds. Um, and so if you ever see one of these, very, very fun to come across. All right, uh, some turtles. Um, just wanted to mention a few of these. Uh, we have the painted turtle, probably the most common turtle you'll see in the state. Uh, they have these yellow head stripes here, which is how you kind of can identify them from other species. Um, and they also have these red markings on the body. So this yellow head and red markings. They're kind of small, maybe like about five-ish inches. Um, very common in ponds, and wetlands, and even like roadside ditches they'll hang out in after rains um, where it gets kind of wet. You can often find a bunch of these guys hanging out in those areas. Um, next we have red-eared slider. So this is actually, um, the red-eared slider is considered an invasive species in the state. Um, it's likely that they were introduced. They're very common in the pet trade and it's likely that someone had one of these and introduced it and it you know really got established um, and now they're kind of just like a, a natural thing to see in our waterways. Um, but the way to distinguish it um, from the painted turtle which it's often confused with is it has a red kind of ear here which is where it gets its name which is different from the painted turtle that is all yellow um, on the head. Uh, they're also a lot bigger and um, you can pretty much find them in any area where there's permanent water. They're probably there. Um, we have our map turtle. Um, these guys, they're called map turtles because if you see the shell here on this guy. Uh, it kind of looks like a topographic map, if you're like a height map um, that you might see. And so very distinguishable kind of characteristics of that shell here. Um, they also have this kind of yellow spot behind the eye uh, if you can get them in hand, you might be able to see that. Um, very common in larger lakes and definitely in rivers. If you ever go like canoeing, you all often see these guys hanging out on the sides of the rivers. Um, and then we've got the box turtle here. Um, this is a turtle that is super cool when you come across them, but they're usually pretty hard to see because of this pattern here is uh, it looks pretty much like the forest floor, which is where you find them. So if you can imagine a bunch of old dead leaves underneath this turtle, you probably wouldn't even be able to notice it. Um, the best way to find these guys is to actually just be really quiet and listening for rustling leaves. And that's usually um, one of these guys walking around. They can be very common and really in quality uh, woodlands. So they are around. And something cool about them is they have what is called a hinged plastron. So a plastron is the underside of a turtle shell. And so you can see here that it's kind of got this hinge right there. And what that allows them to do is completely like box themselves up inside their shell so they're like completely protected. Um, and some people think this is kind of an evolutionary response to like forest fires and this allows them to stay safe. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I definitely have heard a lot of people uh, say that before. But it's really cool if you pick up one of these guys, they will often do this right away. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, and then last thing, just uh, point out a few snakes to you guys. Um, and so in Michigan, we have three uh, Thamnophis or garter uh, snakes here in the state. Um, and they all pretty much look exactly the same, but there is a little trick that I'll mention to you guys how to identify them from each other. And so they all kind of have these three stripes. So one going down the back and then two going down the sides. Um, these guys can be really, really pretty. They can be like really blue in color or red in color. They have lots of different uh, variability in far as that. Um, and you pretty much find them in every habitat that you can find. I studied uh, garter snakes in downtown Ann Arbor. So they were hanging out in downtown areas in a city, which is not usually a place where you would think to look for wildlife. Um, and so the trick to identifying these guys from each other is by looking at the stripe on the side of their body and counting the scale rows here. So if you look at uh, this kind of close up of the side of this garter snake, you see these uh, big scales, which are called scutes, and they wrap around the underside of the animal. And then going up from those, you have different rows of scales. So one row of scales, two row of scales, three row of scales. And so on an Eastern garter snake, this, uh, their side stripe will be completely confined to scale rows two and three. So on this individual, um, that, that side stripe is on two and three, meaning that this is an Eastern garter snake. Um, on the Butler's garter snakes, it'll be on two and going up all the way into the fourth row. 
and then on the ribbon snake, it is only on the third and fourth row. So it's kind of a little bit tricky to figure out, but it is kind of cool if you ever get one of these in hand, kind of look at the side and count the scales. Um, I always try to remember, like remind myself, like people wear ribbons in their hair, and so the side stripe is on the higher scales, kind of how I remember that it's three and four, um, but kind of a fun, and not a lot of people actually know this about how to identify um, garter snakes. Um, next we have our brown snake, which this is probably one of the most common snakes that you can find in the state. Um, they're often called the city snake in a lot of field guides because you can actually find them underneath dumpsters in like downtown areas um, and stuff. They uh, like pretty much specialize on eating slugs. Um, and so if any of you are gardeners, these guys are really nice to have around because they will just devour all the slugs that are trying to eat all your vegetables. Um, so a really helpful animal to have around. Um, and they're kind of have this brown going, brown stripe kind of going down the side and they have these little black dots that uh, kind of are in pairs going down the length of their body. These guys are only about six inches long. They're pretty small um, and they're kind of cute, I think. Uh, not many people think snakes are cute, but this guy I think is pretty universally cute. Um, all right, uh, I think I've got two more snakes I wanted to talk about. Um, we've got the Northern water snake. Um, and so a lot of people confuse these with water moccasins, water moccasins from the southern United States. These guys are not water moccasins. They are not venomous. They are completely harmless to humans. Um, water moccasins are a venomous species, but you don't have to worry about that with these guys because they are non-venomous to humans. Um, they uh, are often found in like rocky areas on the edge of shores. They eat fish, um, so they're really good swimmers and catch fish. Um, and are able to do that. And they have this cool kind of banding pattern. And you'll notice that these dark bands, they go all the way down the side of the animal, um, uh, which is different from any other species that kind of have this sort of banding uh, pattern. Uh, oh, I have two more. Um, this is the Eastern hognose snake. This is probably one of the coolest snakes that we have in Michigan. Um, they're called hognose because they have this upturned snout um, which kind of makes it look like they're like have a, a hog nose um, and they use that to kind of dig in sandy areas to get out of the sun so they'll bury themselves underneath the dirt uh, with this kind of nose that they have. Um, these guys are often called puff adders um, <clears throat> but they are they are not puff adders they are non-venomous they have never seen one of these bite anyone um, but they get that name because you can kind of see here <laughs> on this uh, individual uh, he's kind of flattening out his head, and they often, as uh, in response to anyone getting close to them, they'll do a lot of hissing, and they will uh, kind of like flatten out their head to try to look all intimidating, um, but they actually don't even have teeth, really. They have two teeth really far in the back of their mouth, um, but they really can't bite you. And then if you see this picture up here, this they will do if you kind of uh, keep approaching them, they will play dead. Um, and so they'll roll over on their backs and they'll stick their tongue out and they'll pretend like they're dead so you don't mess with them. And it's kind of funny if you, uh, if you try to flip them back over so they're right side up, they'll just kind of keep flipping themselves back over uh, continuously. Um, so like, hey, no, I'm dead, leave me alone. Like, I'm serious, I'm dead. Um, and it's kind of a fun sort of thing to see if you ever find one of these guys. And then the last one I wanted to talk about is the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Um, and so uh, these guys are like wetland specialists. You pretty much will only find these guys if you're going out into like prairie fens or bogs um, and stuff like that, really kind of swampy areas. Um, and they have this kind of cool, what is called a saddle pattern going on their back. And this sort of pattern is really, uh, it's always looks like this on every individual kind of has this pattern. So they're really distinguished from other snakes once you know what you're looking for. Um, sometimes water snakes get confused with them, but once you realize that these have that saddle pattern and not that banding pattern, um, they're pretty distinguishable. Um, if you've ever heard of, heard like a diamondback rattlesnake on uh, like a action movie or something like that, it's kind of a really loud, like a rain stick almost sort of sound. Um, these guys, they're known as pygmy rattlesnakes. Um, and so their rattle, it sounds more like a big bumblebee kind of flying by. Um, and so it's, it's a lot less intimidating than a diamondback rattlesnake. Um, and these guys are often kind of like 
they're kind of like the scaredy cats of the snake world. They like immediately run. They're super afraid of everything. Um, often you don't hear them rattling, um, but you can see if you ever see one of these, uh, one of these guys. Um, and they are federally endangered, uh, fairly recently listed on the Federal, Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, and so they are uh, protected by the government. Um, if you see one of these guys, it is a really, really cool sight. Not many people actually ever get to see these um, in their lives. All right. So now I just wanted to quick go over kind of how, like I showed you a lot of animals um, and I kind of want to show you like, how do you find these things? A lot of people don't have any clue on how to find this thing. Um, so for salamanders, salamanders are probably the easiest uh, herp to find. Um, if you go out into any forested areas and kind of look for kind of low, kind of wet soil areas, um, that's usually where there are going to be a lot of salamanders. Um, and so what you do is look for downed like trees or any sort of other debris and kind of like flip those logs over. And you can see from this picture, it's a little hard to see, but inside this red circle here is a um, blue spotted salamander that I found. And he was just underneath this log, you flip it over and he's just kind of there hanging out. They like these areas because they're really uh, moist. They retain moisture really well. And because they're amphibians, they need that water um, to keep them going. So if you ever, next time you're walking out in the woods, try flipping over a log or two and see if you'll probably find either a blue spotted or a red back salamander, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, frogs, um, frogs can be a little tricky to actually get a hold of, but if you go around to pretty much any body of water, you're gonna find frogs, there are gonna be frogs there. Um, I kind of put on here, nets can be useful because if you actually wanna get a hold of a frog near a body of water, you're probably gonna have to net it in some sort of way. Uh, they're really quick. Um, if you ever walked up to like a woodland pond, uh, you'll see a bunch of little frogs jump in the water, um, and that's usually why they're hard to catch. Uh, and that's often why herpetologists who study frogs, they usually just listen for frog calls to know where they are, um, because that's a kind of a definitive way to do that. And um, because amphibians are more active in the nighttime, because it's cooler and it's less hot and less dry, uh, listening for them at night is usually the preferred method to do that. Or if you have like a headlamp and you go out into a pond in the middle of the night, you're going to find so many frogs. And it's a great way to kind of uh, see that diversity. Um, turtles, uh, I, the way I've always found turtles is pretty much like go canoeing, go canoeing on a lake or a river. Um, you're going to see all these sorts of turtles kind of doing what these guys are doing here. Where they're basking uh, on these logs on the edge of waterways. Um, and if you have like binoculars, you can kind of really get to see them up close and you might be able to actually identify the different uh, species. Um, if you're really stealthy, you can bring a net with you in your canoe and you can try to like scoop them up. Um, as long as you put them back, there's no real harm in doing that. Um, and that can be a good way to actually get a hold of an aquatic turtle. Um, and then snakes are probably the hardest uh, like herp to find because they're very cryptic. They're really good at hiding. They love to hide. And so um, it can be hard to find them. If you have any, know any areas where is there any sort of down debris, kind of like with salamanders where you flip stuff, sometimes you might find a snake because snakes really like to, uh, they like to hide out in those areas as well. And so that can be maybe a little shocking depending on your preference for those animals. Um, this is, this picture here, you can see this was may, uh, from doing my research where I put out a bunch of sheets of plywood and this one day I flipped this one and I think there was four garter snakes that were all hanging out underneath this board that I quickly grabbed up. Um, they really, really to find them is to kind of go into areas with a lot of heterogeneous habitat or like a lot of mixture of different types of habitat because really what you, you really just want to look for an area where you're going to be able to see the ground, but that will also have enough vegetation for snakes and stuff to be there as well. Uh, it's pretty much you really want to look for areas that you can actually are going to be able to see them. Because lots of times you walk through a prairie, you're probably surrounded by snakes, uh, but you're never gonna be able to see them because they blend in so well with everything around them. Um, and then last point would be, if you know of an area that's got like a nice big body of water or a good pond, um, that's gonna attract frogs, which is that is then gonna attract lots of snakes because a lot of snakes actually eat frogs. Um, so that could be a way to kind of find snakes. Usually you just do a lot of looking at the ground when you're looking for snakes. Um, all right, and so just a few kind of words to the wise about doing this sort of uh, activity. Um, if you're looking for salamanders or flipping over stuff, 
it's really important to make sure that you put those objects as close to as where you found them um, because these animals really rely on those micro conditions underneath those debris. And if you don't flip them back over, it's going to dry out and they're going to have to find a new place to live. And depending on where they are, they might not be able to find a place to live. Um, so it's really important to put those sorts of things back. Um, if you find a salamander underneath a log, um, you want to kind of move them out from the log because you don't want to squish them when you put the log back. A lot of people just kind of flip logs back over on animals, which is a great way to kind of probably hurt an animal. Um, so you always just kind of want to take them out, flip the log back, and then kind of set them next to the log, and they'll know what to do. They'll go back underneath the log, and they'll be uh, safe and sound again. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that uh, amphibians, they breathe a lot through their skin. Um, and because of that, it's really important if you are wearing like hand lotions or hand sanitizers, especially now with COVID, um, to really not handle the animals because then you're going to be putting all of that stuff into their bloodstream, which is not going to be good for them. So usually, yeah, I'll either bring a glove with me to handle the animals, like a gardener's glove or a plastic glove would be fine. Or, you know, if you're in the woods, there's going to be leaves everywhere. So you can usually just kind of pick up a leaf and kind of scoop them up like I have in this picture. And then you can kind of look at them up close. Um, next we have, uh, so for like handling snakes, um, if you're handling these animals, you can see here in this picture here that I'm using two hands. That's really the preferred way to handle an animal. If you're kind of dangling them from their tail, uh, you're going to probably, you could hurt them. And so if you're going to handle these animals, it's really important to try to use two hands, one up by the head, one by the, the, uh, the lower half. Um, they might bite you. They'll probably bite you. It doesn't really usually hurt very much. Um, and then they usually let go and go, oh, that was kind of stupid. Why did I do that? And then they'll just kind of hang out like this one is. Um, and then also for turtles, if you ever see a turtle crossing the road, and this kind of goes for all wildlife that you might see, um, the best, really the best thing to do is like, you, you know, you can admire it and look at it that's, and that sort of thing. But don't like a lot, I hear a lot of people be like, oh, I found this turtle. So I picked them up and brought them over to a pond that I know of and released them. That's not going to be good for the turtle. Really what you want to do is just kind of put them going in the direction that they were going on the other side of the road. Um, you know, they live in that area. They know that area. Often animals don't do very well when they're relocated. Um, and so you see uh, like a turtle on the road, which is a pretty common thing, you know, just kind of push them along the side or, you know, uh, get them to the other side of the road and they'll go do their thing. If you see a snapping turtle, uh, be careful of snapping turtles because they can do some serious damage. Uh, usually I would recommend getting like a stick to kind of coerce them to the other side of the road. Um, if you have to handle a snapping turtle in this picture here, this is how professionals handle snapping turtles is you got to hold them by the back of their shell. That is the only place where they are unable to get you um, with their jaws. And so if you if you absolutely have to, uh, that would be the way to do it. But I would probably recommend just using like a stick or something instead. All right. And then uh, the last thing I want to mention with kind of general herpetology is just some ways that you can get involved uh, with doing herpetology. So the Michigan DNR has a really cool kind of program that they do. They call it the Frog and Toad Survey, where you can go onto the Michigan DNR website or Google Michigan DNR Frog and Toad Survey. Um, and you can fill out a form and you will, can get like some wetlands that you can get assigned to do. And you can go out to those wetlands and listen for frog calls and kind of keep track of all the calls that you hear um, as the spring kind of rolls into summer. Um, and what that does is that provides the state with a lot of information of where certain species are in the state. Um, are, have they, are they no longer there? Are they new to that area? And it also lets us know about like phenology or like when they become active and when they're breeding, which can be really important for lots of research. Um, the DNR obviously can't fund a bunch of DNR officers to go do this. So they really rely on uh, citizen science to kind of do this and help them out with this. Um, and a lot of researchers use this information to do lots of conservation work with these species. Um, there are two cell phone apps, the Michigan Herp Atlas and also Herp Mapper. Um, these two cell phone apps, I have them both on my phone. Um, they're kind of a fun way to kind of, uh, kind of almost gamify uh, like 
herpetology. And so you can, if you find a species with these apps, you can take a picture of them and then it gets uploaded into a database. And then, uh, you know, a, like a professional herpetologist will, you know, verify that record. And then that can be accessed by either the DNR or researchers or other just conservation oriented um, people to get access to information on where species are and where they aren't to do lots of uh, really cool conservation work. One of the most important things for conservation with the, this group is just kind of knowing where they are um, and knowing where they're kind of, uh, where they have been. Um, and really with citizen science is really the only way that we can kind of uh, get that information. Um, and then also I kind of put on here just general enthusiasm. As I mentioned earlier, lots of people kind of don't like these groups. They think they're slimy or they're gross um, or they're scary uh, in terms of like snakes. And so kind of just what I like to do is just try to tell people why I think these guys are cool um, and what interests me about this group. And I find that is usually a good way to get people kind of interested in this sort of thing. And the more the general public cares about these things, the more they're going to be protected. Um, so I always kind of just encourage people to just be enthusiastic about the things they are interested in. All right, so I just wanted to talk about a few uh, special topics here uh, about just interesting things in the state of Michigan um, in regards to Michigan herpetology. Um, so overwintering is a huge thing for ectothermic animals, right? They, their body temperatures are the temperature that it is outside. And in Michigan, we're in the winter there's an average high of below freezing um, that kind of causes some problems for those animals because if they freeze alive, uh, they're generally going to die and not survive. Um, so they have to find ways to prevent uh, freezing. And so lots of animals have lots of behavioral or physiological adaptations to be able to uh, withstand the cold Michigan winters. Um, so this is a picture of, it looks like a garter snake out on the ice. Garter snakes will actually come out on the ice at, for brief periods um, when it warms up a little bit to try to get some food every once in a while, but you don't want to get stuck out like this. If one of those snakes got, didn't make it back to their hibernation area, they would freeze and they wouldn't make it. So uh, turtles do a lot of really crazy stuff when it comes to overwintering. They do a lot of behavioral stuff as well as physiological stuff. Um, and so this is a picture of a snapping turtle that has uh, recently come out from, uh, you know, hyper, from the winter period. And so what a lot of them do is they just kind of bury themselves deep down as far as they can into the mud underneath bodies of water. Um, and so what that does is it kind of creates like an insulating layer from the freezing cold air into the ground and where they are it actually doesn't uh, get cold enough to freeze and so then they can make it through the winter. Um, and there's a study that looked at this and they found that pretty much every snapping turtle in this one area by early fall had buried themselves. And then almost all of those turtles, they didn't move at all throughout the entire winter. Um, they just stayed completely put underneath uh, the mud and just waiting for uh, the spring to come. And so this kind of poses a problem with, well, how do you survive without oxygen? You still need to have oxygen in order to keep your cells uh, functioning. And so uh, turtles have a lot of adaptations for kind of managing that sort of situation. Um, and so they can really, really reduce their metabolism if they need to. And so on these, uh, these graphs here kind of show metabolism of different turtles under different conditions. Um, and so an overwintering uh, painted turtle has the metabolism that is equal to 0.1% of that of a regular sized mammal. So mm -hmm. they really just shut down their bodies um, in order to preserve all the energy stores that they have. Um, and if you notice uh, this uh, anoxic and uh, anoxic submergent, so at like uh, 24 degrees Celsius, we're kind of in the, we're in like regular numbers here, one, two, three, four. If we look at, uh, uh, anoxic submergence or like submergence without oxygen in freezing temperatures um, or hibernating temperatures, you can see that this is like 0 0.02, 0 0.04. Um, so their metabolism is, is pretty much shut down. It's actually about 10,000 times less than it is um, at normal temperatures uh, when they are uh, holding their breath essentially and in a freezing cold environment. So this is kind of a fun fact of 
it would take a hibernating turtle approximately seven days to raise their body temperature by 0.1 degrees Celsius if they stored up all of the metabolic energy over the course of that time, uh, which I think really kind of illustrates how they've just pretty much shut their bodies down and that's how they get through um, the winter. This is like true hibernation. Um, you don't see this a lot in species. Um, and then kind of the most interesting thing I think about all of this is uh, this thing that turtles are able to do, which is called aquatic respiration. Um, and so they can actually breathe through other uh, methods as opposed to just breathing the air. They can actually use the water to get oxygen out of it. Um, and so they can do skin breathing, breathing through their skin, uh, breathing through their gular area or like inside the mouth cavity, um, or they could do cloacal breathing, uh, which is kind of like, you know, the urogenital hole or like their butt. Um, so they can kind of literally breathe through their butt, which is pretty crazy, I think. Um, and so these numbers here is like 18% of uh, their oxygen, they can get through their skin, 49 in some species through their mouth, and some turtles can get 73% of their oxygen strictly through their cloaca. Um, and so here in this picture, this is an electron micrograph of the inside of a turtle's cloaca. Um, and if you have any uh, like anatomy knowledge, you'll know, you might notice that this kind of looks a lot like a really rudimentary lung. Um, you have all these little pockets where uh, gas exchange could occur in this area. And so these turtles have these really branched uh, cloacal bursae is what they're called that allow them to respirate through their cloaca, just bring water in through their cloaca and then they can get oxygen that way. So if they need oxygen while they're under the water, they actually have a lot of strategies um, for doing that, um, which I think is crazy. I think it's absolutely crazy. Um, next, I just want to talk about uh, some social behavior. So reptiles are generally considered one of the least social uh, animals on the planet. Um, if you look at most uh, like wild or like social biology textbooks, um, they pretty much all just say, oh, reptiles don't have any social behavior. They're not social. They don't do any social stuff. Um, but recently, that's kind of being shown to not really be the case. Um, and so this picture here is a picture of a bunch of garter snakes that are um, emerging from their hibernation over the winter. And you can see that there's thousands. There are literally sometimes thousands of these snakes all hibernating together. <laughs> um, and to say that they're not um, social in any way, even though they group in these large groups, is in my view kind of a little myopic or short-sighted. Um, there, there has to be social interactions going on. And that's kind of what researchers are discovering, is that they are social, but they're just cryptically social. They're not social in ways that um, we uh, as humans can really readily detect. Um, they're using like scent cues and other sorts of things like that that we don't pick up on. Um, and so, as I mentioned, hibernation, social behavior is being discovered. There's actually a lot of parental care um, that is being discovered in a lot of snakes, um, suggesting a lot of social behavior. And even some mate deception, especially in garter snakes. Some garter snakes will pretend they will, they will produce female pheromones to trick males into going in the wrong directions while they can sneak off and find the females, um, which is like a highly social behavior uh, that even lots of uh, other animals can't, don't have those sorts of behaviors. So there's this really, really cool study that came out this year where they kind of tried to look at sociality in garter snakes. And so you can see this picture here is kind of, this was like their experimental setup for this study where they had these enclosures with four different shelters in them and then they would place snakes in these enclosures and kind of monitor their behavior. And right off the bat, when you just put one snake alone in this area, they were already finding that snakes differed in personality or what they called boldness. So some snakes would like to hang out in the open area and kind of just be exposed, while some snakes would immediately kind of hide in one of the shelters really quickly, which from that would already suggest that there are you know, differences in personalities and that there's the potential for some social interactions to occur between these animals. Um, and then as they continue the experiment, they would put larger numbers of snakes all in the enclosure at the same time. And what they found was that the snakes always prefer to hibernate or to shelter with large groups of snakes. They always like to be with uh, other snakes while they're sheltering 
which you know suggest that they prefer to be with other animals and uh, prefer to have that sort of like safety in numbers sort of thing, which suggests more social behavior. Um, and then the coolest part of this whole study is that if you took a hibernating animal and you moved it into from a group of snakes to a different group of snakes, it would always go back to the first group that it was with and showing that they really prefer to be with the individuals that they have like grown to know. And so that these snakes, they're really, they really form social networks by sheltering and hibernating with each other and they prefer to be with certain individuals and that they're kind of forming like quote unquote friendships with each other, which to me is being told that snakes don't have any social behavior my whole life. And then kind of learning that, no, they actually really do form a lot of social networks and social behaviors, I thought was really cool. Um, and so not a lot of people probably knew that. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was probably the coolest thing that occurs in regards to herpetology in Michigan. And that is the uh, unisexual salamanders. Um, and so in Michigan and throughout like the Northeast, as you can see on this map in this gray area, there is a, a group of all female unisexual salamanders that dates back about 5 million years um, of evolutionary history throughout this area, um, which I'm sure I definitely didn't know this when I, uh, when I first learned about this. And so these are these all female uh, salamanders. What they do is they kind of, they co-depend upon certain uh, sexual species in the in this range and they have a completely unique mode of reproduction that no other uh, like life form uh, does this sort of reproductive behavior where it's, it's been called kleptogenesis and so what they do is when salamanders mate they do kind of a little mating dance in the water and then the male will uh, they will drop what is called a spermatophore which is a little like sperm packet um, and then the females will pick those up and kind of bring them inside to have internal fertilization. And so what these all female salamanders do is they come in and they kind of steal the sperm packet that the male has uh, deposited, but then they don't necessarily use that material. Just doing that action stimulates their own egg development and they start producing clonal individuals um, from their egg set, from their eggs. Um, and so this is like a really, really crazy cool behavior that uh, no other animal kind of shows. Um, and so here's a picture of, these are unisexual salamanders here. And you see that they look kind of different. And that's because they actually kind of take on the phenotype of the species that they are stealing the sperm from. So you can see that we have this tiger salamander looking individual here. Here's a blue spotted salamander looking individual here. Um, and so it's really, really crazy. And you can't really identify them from each other. You have to kind of use genetics to kind of uh, figure out what you're looking at. And so, uh, as I mentioned, they, they kind of steal that DNA. But even more interesting than that is that they can do all sorts of crazy stuff with that DNA. So they can ignore the stolen DNA and just uh, produce clones. Um, they can incorporate like a chromosome from that DNA um, into one of their offspring, or they can remove their own chromosomes from the eggs and have like a reduction in chromosomes in their eggs. And they can do all of that in the same clutch of eggs. So you get this real huge mixture of different uh, genetic material coming out of these offspring. Um, pretty much the only rule that we know of so far in the system is that they always have one set of blue spotted uh, chromosomes. So one of these guys here. Um, but besides that, you can have four different ploidy levels or numbers of chromosome sets. So you can have two sets of chromosomes, you can have three sets of chromosomes, or you could have uh, four or even five sets of chromosomes all in the same individual. Um, and then because of this, there are 22 distinct different genome combinations. So you could have some blue spotted DNA in there, you could have some tiger salamander DNA in there. You could just have blue spotted DNA in there. Um, so it really creates this huge, huge hybrid complex of these um, animals. And so uh, researchers have really 
kind of wondered about like, how does this maintain itself? Uh, pretty much everything that we know about ecology and competition should say that if these species are habitating in the same areas and they're kind of fulfilling the same ecological role, then they should drive each other out. One of these species shouldn't exist because the competition would drive one to win out over the other one. Um, and so some researchers and my graduate school advisor works on this and they propose this idea of this geographical parthenogenesis hypothesis, which pretty much says that, well, maybe the, uh, the unisexual individuals are uh, occupying like marginal or worse habitat than the sexual species. Um, and that might allow them to still persist in this environment, but not be driven out by competition. Um, and so on this graph here that you see on the right, on the, the y-axis, we have landscape resistance. And so the bigger that number, the worse the habitat is. And then on the x-axis, we have the different species. So if it says like Jeff only, that means it's only a sexual species of a Jeffersonian salamander um, and where they're found or LJJ, that is a genome combination of a unisexual species here. And so what you're kind of seeing is that with this one, um, when they went out and they sampled a bunch of salamanders and they kind of looked at where they were occupying, they found that the unisexual salamanders were by and large occupying worse habitat. They were very much occupying this marginal habitat, which would support this hypothesis that you know, they partitioned themselves out so they're not in direct competition. However, if we look at different species or different um, unisexual genome combinations, uh, we kind of found, they found the opposite trend in that this, the unisexual species were very much occupying the better habitat. And so not really a clear picture. It does look like they do, they do partition themselves within their habitat, so they're not in direct competition. Well, is there any really clear model as to how they do that or what they, how they figure that out? Um, one of the things that has been proposed is that because they all have this uh, blue spotted chromosome set and blue spotted salamanders have the most northern range of any North American salamander, that those genes might allow them to occupy a wider range of habitats because they'd be able to occupy colder habitats or warmer habitats um, because of that blue spotted DNA. Um, and a lot of this kind of comes down to that there's the potential loss for both species because if the unisexuals outcompete sexual species, once the sexual species are gone, then they can't reproduce because they rely on that uh, behavior and they rely on those sexual species to reproduce. Um, but if, you know, if the, uh, so then you could have a loss of both species in that case. And so that's why a lot of these salamanders are actually endangered because you can't readily know which ones you're looking at. And so you don't necessarily know if the population is all unisexual or if it's a sexual species. Um, and so there's a lot of potential loss for uh, both species um, because of the system. And it's kind of it's really interesting and a lot of uh, cool work is coming out of this uh, very unique phenomena that we have here in Michigan. And so with that, uh, it was probably a little long. Um, thanks for sticking with me. On that, uh, that is all I have for you guys. Um, I hope that was uh, enjoyable and entertaining for you. Um, and if you have any questions or anything, I'm happy to stick around and talk for a little bit. If you guys uh, have any things that popped into mind or anything like that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so Will frogs call all season or just in the early part? I know bullfrogs will call all summer. Yeah, long. so it depends on the species. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, um, the like toads and wood frogs, they're what are called like explosive breeders. And so like pretty much the second that there is water in ponds, they all of the individuals in an area all breed all at once over like a week period. Um, but then there are things like, yeah, like green frogs and bullfrogs, they'll pretty much just keep breeding all year round. And that really uh, relies on the sort of habitat, specific habitat that they live in um, or breed in. So toads often breed in ponds that dry up by late spring. And so 
once the water's dried up, they, their tadpoles can't grow. And so there isn't really an uh, option to mate at that uh, point in the year. But like a green frog or a bullfrog, they'll, you know, they'll be in like large lakes and stuff that aren't going to dry out. So they can kind of keep breeding um, all like season long. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm.